Hi, this is John Holzberger. Today we're going to be doing a lecture on upper extremity nerve blocks. We're going to cover the ITE keywords and we're going to try to do it in a brief, very focused kind of way. So, you know, this will not be a comprehensive review, but more of a kind of hitting the highlights and try to give you a refresher to help you prepare for the ITE this year. When you really step back and take a bird's eye view, the human nervous system is really incredible. And I always felt like this exhibit from Body World um, really drove that point home where um, I don't know the details of how they dissected and dissolved away the other tissues, but what they were left with was uh, a real cadaver, um, you know, isolated human nervous system. And, you know, in this particular lecture, we're going to be focusing in on the brachial plexus, which comes from the five uh, roots, C5, 6, 7, 8, T1, and provides uh, motor and sensory innervation to the bilateral upper extremities. Here it is, the brachial plexus. This diagram has been giving medical students chest pain since 1765. If you're anything like me, this was one of the more painful things to try to memorize in medical school. What I'd like to do is just kind of focus on some of the important things um, that are relevant for you that, that I think you need to know. Um, in particular, the you know, progression from Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches, like Randy Travis drinks cold beer. There's so many different mnemonics to remember that. But the reason that's relevant is because our brachial plexus blocks, uh, we're going to be targeting different segments of the brachial plexus. And the reason that they block the things they do is because of where we're blocking them uh, along their course. The areas that get spared or the areas that get covered, it kind of all works together. And so um, just as a brief review, there's five roots. I remember that because you have five fingers um, and you get C5 through T1, like we mentioned. Those roots then combine into just three trunks, superior, middle, and inferior. That kind of makes sense because if you just are looking at the diagram, um, intuitively it fits. Those trunks then each split and so your three trunks give rise to six divisions. Each trunk basically has an anterior and posterior division so three times two you get to six divisions. Those divisions then combine again uh, into cords. You get a lateral, posterior, and medial cord the way I remember this is that there's no anterior cord because if there was, it'd be easier to block. So of course there's not one. Instead, it's posterior hiding behind the artery. Those cords then ultimately give rise to the five major branches of the upper arm, the muscular cutaneous, axillary, median, radial, and ulnar nerves. Now, of course, the brachial plexus in vivo doesn't really look like the schematics or diagrams that we often see in textbooks, but the anatomy that we have learned from those is still quite relevant. Just a couple things I'd like to point out here. If you look up high in the neck, um, where the nerve roots of the brachial plexus are exiting in between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, you also see the phrenic nerve coming through there, which is why we almost always get diaphragmatic paralysis on the side of an interscaling block because as we're blocking those C567 roots, we're also catching the phrenic nerve. And this also shows if you look a little bit below uh, that area, you can kind of behind the subclavian artery a little bit see uh, C8 and T1. Those nerve roots ultimately give rise to an ulnar distribution, and that's why an interscaling block typically misses those. We tend to just hit the top three roots, five, six, seven, um, in that little snowman configuration in the neck, but we miss the, the lower ones. And so an interscaling block provides great coverage to the upper arm, to the shoulder, 
uh, but it kind of misses that ulnar distribution and then isn't great for the lower arm. If you travel just a little bit down the brachial plexus to the region just above the clavicle, you can kind of see why a supraclavicular block may not work well for the shoulder. And that's because, the, for example, the suprascapular nerve, which provides innervation to the shoulder, is branching off. And many times, um, the, the area that we place a supraclavicular, we don't capture that nerve at the level of the trunks where we're performing the block. The divisions usually occur kind of behind the clavicle, and then the cords are emerging below where you would be performing an infraclavicular block. All right, so now let's jump into a little bit more detail on the most common blocks of the brachial plexus. The interscaling block. I'm going to try to hit main highlights and, and pearls and pitfalls. There's so many incredible resources available to go into more detail on these blocks. And I would encourage you to use those. Particularly, I enjoy the ones on Nysora for ultrasound guided approaches to, to doing all of these blocks. Um, but I'm gonna try to cover some of the basics here. Um, so as we discussed, um, the inner scaling nerve block is targeting the roots of the brachial plexus. Uh, right where they're merging between the anterior and middle scaling muscles. Again, the roots that we typically capture are five, six, seven. And like I talked about, this is why it's great for shoulder surgery, clavicle, upper arm surgery, um, but not for lower arm surgery because of that ulnar sparing, missing those inferior nerve roots. When you're performing this block, um, you're going to be entering the skin with your needle uh, several centimeters above the clavicle with the head turned away and coming from kind of a posterior approach. So the red arrow in the top left picture is kind of showing you your needle trajectory, the blue rectangle, your ultrasound uh, positioning. Um, and, and oftentimes those three nerve roots tend to stack right on top of each other. People call it a snowman or a stoplight configuration. And that's where you wanna be injecting your local anesthetic. If you were using nerve stimulation, you'd be looking for twitching of the shoulder, biceps or triceps. Um, you know, like we had mentioned, the phrenic nerve um, lies a little bit anterior to where the roots are. So if you're ever doing nerve stim and you get hiccups, you should try to redirect a little bit more posteriorly. The things to really note about this, uh, the inner scaling block is that if you're doing it right, you're going to have pretty darn close to 100% incidence of phrenic nerve involvement, which is gonna cause hemidiaphragmatic paralysis on that side. And so you have to be mindful of this in patients who may not be able to tolerate that. The most healthy patients with more or less normal or adequate pulmonary function will do just fine. But certainly if you have patients who have severe COPD, uh, poor pulmonary function, um, or the worst case scenario is somebody who has some sort of uh, contralateral phrenic nerve injury, which happens you, every once in a while, you'll see somebody who has a chest X-ray with an elevated hemidiaphragm. You have to be mindful of that because if you knock out the diaphragm on the other side, uh, that can cause respiratory distress for these patients. You can see in the ultrasound image, um, the, the blue arrow is the sternocleidomastoid and the uh, nerve roots in between the anterior scaling and the middle scaling. And then also for completeness, the carotid artery and vertebral artery. Now, I, the thing I want you to notice as well here is the vertebral artery is in fairly close proximity to where you're placing this block. And um, you just have to be mindful that you're aspirating, that you're watching for you know, signs of vascular injection because uh, obviously um, injecting a large volume of local anesthetic into the vertebral artery could be catastrophic. Some other less common but possible uh, side effects or complications can be uh, hoarseness due to recurrent laryngeal nerve block, 
um, and Horner syndrome because of some of the anesthetic tracking up uh, causing a sympathetic cervical block. So moving on to the supraclavicular block, um, this has been called the spinal of the arm, sort of the uh, best bang for your buck um, in terms of blocking the upper extremity. Um, you're blocking at the level of the trunks and the bra brachial plexus where everything is kind of bundled tightly together, but you're still up fairly high in the neck. And so you catch just about everything before it starts to branch off, with the one exception being the uh, suprascapular nerve. And so that does provide some sensory innervation to the shoulder. And that's essentially why this is uh, good for just about everything from mid humerus down, but won't cover the shoulder in most cases. Dr. Greider used to teach these lectures back when I was a resident, and uh, he always really advocated for these blocks, um, particularly if you had to choose between this and an axillary block, um, simply because you get better coverage in less time. Um, and with ultrasound guidance, these blocks can be done with uh, incredible safety, efficiency, um, and, and really well tolerated by patients. Um, in terms of needle positioning and entry, you can see in the top left picture, um, your probe is gonna sort of be on, resting on top of the clavicle. Your needle entry path is gonna come sort of from a lateral, uh, from lateral to medial. Um, you know, with the interscaling before we talked about kind of looking for the snowman or stop sign, here, uh, your nerves are bundled more tightly and, and the trunks kind of will appear like a little bundle of grapes. Um, these are usually just kind of lateral to the subclavian artery. In some cases, depending on, uh, I've seen it be a little bit closer to being a, uh, on top of the artery. Um, but regardless, usually scanning up and down the neck, you can you can kind of follow the uh, nerve roots from the inner scaling uh, region of the brachial plexus down into um, where you find the trunks. And um, if you are using nerve stimulator, you want to look for twitching of the hand and fingers. Um, when you're doing the uh, local anesthetic injection, um, you're going to usually do uh, at least two, sometimes three injections. And Typically, the first injection is going to be in that ultrasound image where you see the blue circle. Um, people kind of refer to that as the corner pocket. That's going to cover um, the inferior trunk. And uh, then you'll want to also withdraw the needle a little bit and try to get uh, some local anesthetic to spread around the middle and superior trunks as well. Um, you do have to be careful here for intravascular injection and also intraneuronal injection. Um, and so, you know, doing, using Doppler on your ultrasound or making sure you're doing a good job with your aspiration uh, prior to injecting is a must. And then, you know, pressure on injection um, as well as nerve stim can help you avoid intraneuronal injection. Uh, you still can get a fairly high incidence of phrenic nerve block and the uh, hemidiaphragmatic paralysis that we've been discussing with the inner scaling. And this is simply because you are so close to where you were doing the inner scaling that oftentimes uh, some local anesthetic will track back up and, and reach high enough to um, encounter the phrenic nerve. And so again, you do have to be mindful of that in patients who could not tolerate uh, having half their diaphragm stop functioning for a period of time. And moving on down, um, we kind of go, th the divisions occur under the clavicle, and then coming out the bottom side, there's the three cords, your lateral, posterior, and medial cords, and this is where we're going to do the infraclavicular block. And this is really my favorite block for um, surgery on the hand in particular, or the distal uh, upper extremity. Um, one significant benefit is we're now further away from the phrenic nerve and, and 
you know, from the neck. And so this block does not cause any um, diaphragmatic paralysis. So you don't really have to worry about that anymore. You still do have to be mindful of pneumothorax as you're still, you know, if, if you aren't following the tip of your needle and, and advancing um, far, you absolutely can get into pleura. So, you know, with all of these blocks, you know, in the neck and the brachial plexus, there's a lot of expensive structures. And so you always have to have good imaging, good needle capture, good needle control. Um, and, and really, you should never be advancing uh, through anything other than the subcutaneous tissue, the immediate subcutaneous tissue, until you have good visualization of your needle. Um, because you're a little bit further down the brachial plexus, you do miss some of the branches and, and therefore don't get um, coverage of the shoulder, and you do get some sparing of the upper arm as well. And so um, really we're talking distal to the elbow um, for the infraclavicular block. You can see a little bit slower onset, um, but really clinically, uh, you know, if you give it the average amount of time that, uh, you know, do the block in pre-op, for example, um, there's plenty of time for it to set up. Um, you're going to position your ultrasound probe where the blue rectangle is, uh, just kind of abutting the inferior aspect of the clavicle. Uh, needle entry will be um, above that. You definitely want to kind of adjust the rotation of your probe to optimize your image. Make sure you're kind of getting the brachial plexus and cross section as much as possible. Um, the reason that this block I think is pretty easy is you just have to find the axillary artery and then visualizing the actual cords is less important. As we talked about before, there's no anterior cord. You just have your lateral, medial, and posterior. And so once you identify that axillary artery, you just need to inject your local anesthetic in sort of a horseshoe or U-shaped pocket kind of under and around the artery. You do have to make sure that you get through that fascial plane that you see uh, on the bottom side of the uh, pec minor. But once you're through that fascial plane close to the artery, you'll usually get a really nice hydrodissection around the artery um, to give you that nice dense distal uh, arm uh, coverage. Um, you still can get into pleura here, so as I mentioned, you do have to be uh, careful about your needle trajectory and keeping good capture. Um, and then obviously anytime you're injecting in close proximity to vasculature, uh, make sure that you're aspirating frequently in between and during injection. So we're going to continue progressing down the brachial plexus, down the arm here, and um, talk about the axillary nerve block. Now, this is a block that historically had a tremendous amount of value and, and you know, is still performed with some frequency. Um, I will be the first to admit, though, that I personally don't really like this block that much. Um, and the main reason is because you're only going to typically hit three of the five, um, you know, major branches of the brachial plexus. So it will cover your median, your ulnar, and your radial nerves. Um, but you're going to miss your muscular cutaneous nerve. And this is something they'll always ask about on tests. It runs within the coracobrachialis. Um, and then you also miss the axillary nerve, which um, is you know, kind of a bit of a misnomer. Um, this block is named for the approach around the axillary artery and, and uh, not the axillary nerve. Um, you, you miss a couple small uh, nerves uh, as well. The intercostal brachial is the other one. And, you know, so basically to get really good, um, you know, analgesia of the kind of mid arm down you typically are going to have to combine the axillary block with a muscular cutaneous block and so in my mind why do two blocks when you could get similar coverage with one now certainly there are some cases where this is useful and in particular if the patient has an injury or a wound or dressing or you know something that is blocking you from getting to uh, a supraclavicular or infraclavicular, 
um, then absolutely this can be a, a useful block. And it is certainly something that should be in your arsenal. It's, you know, as I said, I just often find myself, um, if I don't have a reason I can't do a supraclavicular or infraclavicular, I tend to favor those as you just get a little bit better coverage with a little bit less effort um, overall. Um, the positioning of the nerves is also highly variable. Um, it, they can pretty much be just about anywhere in a, in a kind of a close proximity around the axillary artery. And so um, essentially what you're going to do is, uh, you know, position the patient so their arm is out, um, take a look for the axillary artery in the armpit, and then you're going to inject local anesthetic kind of in a circumferential pattern around the axillary artery. Um, if you're doing nerve stem, you'll look for twitching of the thumb and fingers. So we've covered most of the major blocks of the brachial plexus. Um, before we wrap this up, though, a couple other uh, keywords I want to touch on, one of which is the upper extremity intravenous block, the beer block. Um, this is a unique block that is, is kind of cool, um, maybe a little terrifying, um, and it has kind of a limited spectrum of uses, and I think that's why we don't see it very often. I don't think I've actually ever seen it done um, in the main ORs at UK. Uh, certainly, I know we have some surgeons at CAS who use this uh, from time to time, but I don't get over there very often, and so I'm not sure if they're currently still doing that or not. I think it's something that as a resident, you should try to at least see it, um, you know, a, a couple times during residency, if at all possible. But, you know, the use cases for this are fairly minimal and typically um, and are, are with, you know, sort of smaller uh, procedures involving the distal upper extremity, uh, like carpal tunnel release, for example, things that are shorter uh, outpatient ambulatory type procedures. Um, and the reason for that is it doesn't really have a fantastic density of, of analgesia, and it's a relatively short duration um, because you have to keep the extremity um, ischemic, uh, essentially. And so to some degree, that limits the time that you can do this. Uh, the way to do a beer block, I'll, I'll run through it here quickly, is basically on the operative arm, you're going to have to start a second IV. Uh, obviously, you'll need an additional one on the non-operative arm um, for, for managing the patient. Uh, after you have that IV in the operative arm, typically in the hands, you're going to place a double cuffed tourniquet. And so you can independently control these two tourniquets on the upper extremity. You're going to have the patient raise their arm over their head for a minute or two while it gets wrapped with some gauze or tight elastic uh, wrap um, to exsanguinate it. And then have the upper tourniquet inflated to about 100 millimeters above systolic pressure. Verify the absence of a radial pulse. Um, and then you're going to kind of alternate tourniquets just to test that each one is working and um, and uh, correctly, um, you know, blocking arterial inflow, venous outflow. Once this has all been established, now you're going to inject about 50 milliliters of half percent lidocaine without epi. And now, so, you know, half percent, so you're looking at five milligrams per mil, so about 250 milligrams. Um, you know, obviously, if that's not a safe dose for your patient, be based on body weight, you're going to have to decrease that. Um, we don't use long-acting ropivacaine or bupivacaine uh, because of the risk for local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Part of this block is to essentially trap that lidocaine long enough um, where it, it's not going to pose as much risk once it wash, washes out. And so, um, like it says here, you once you've injected, uh, no matter what you end up doing next, you have to leave a cuff up for at least 20 minutes um, because you don't want that 250 milligrams of lidocaine to just uh, to wash out prematurely into the patient. Um, you know, you can imagine in, in even a you know 70 
75 kilo adult that you're starting to kind of flirt with doses that could be dangerous. And, and this is all straight intravascular. Um, you know, it's different when you're doing like a nerve block or something and you inject a, you know, a depot of anesthetic, which can, which can be taken up into circulation. This is straight into the circulation. And so, um, you've just got to be cautious. Um, it typically takes five to 10 minutes for the block to set up um, before you can begin the procedure. And then sometimes around like kind of 25 to 35 minutes, the patient may start to have some tourniquet pain from that upper um, tourniquet that's been inflated. So in that instance, now at that point, the area where the lower tourniquet is located should hopefully be somewhat anesthetized and so you basically inflate that lower cuff and then release the upper cuff. And that will often buy you a little bit more time um, where they won't be complaining of tourniquet pain anymore. Uh, there's not really any absolute contraindications other than, you know, allergy or patient refusal. Uh, but certainly be careful if, you know, it doesn't seem like a tourniquet's going to uh, create a good um, Seal's not the right word, but uh, for example, like if they have a large cone-shaped arm or a very obese arm, for example, where you may not get um, really good compression with the tourniquet, you probably want to avoid this. Um, you know, and then kind of like we talked about things that are more invasive, involve bones. Um, uh, you know, use common sense where, where these things really aren't um, appropriate. Even if you've had the cuff up for 20 minutes and the procedure is done or 30, 40 minutes, however long it's been, um, you can see symptoms when you release the cuffs and that and you get that washout. Uh, kind of the things that you typically would be asking your patients about when you're injecting local anesthetic, like some perioral numbness or ringing in the ears, blurry vision, um, dizziness. Those things can happen, but usually that's pretty transient. Um, last is actually pretty rare when you look at the, the numbers and the incidents when this is done by experienced providers, you know, but it's obviously something you have to be mindful of because you're giving a pretty large dose um, of local anesthetic direct, directly intravascular. And so you've got to be careful. Um, you know, we, we kind of touched on a few of the maybe, you know, uh, cases where this would be useful, but for most of the things that we're doing involving the upper extremity. Um, I personally tend to feel like usually an infraclavicular or supraclavicular uh, block may be a better choice. It gives you longer lasting analgesia. Um, you know, they get post-operative pain control as well. Uh, it gives you a denser block. Um, you know, so you may see this from time to time. You should know about it. You should kind of have a basic understanding of how to do it. Um, but for a lot of people, it's not something that they're doing frequently. So the last block that I wanted to touch on today before we finish up is the cervical plexus block. Um, nowadays, when somebody says this, they what they really mean is a superficial cervical plexus block in most cases. Historically, there's also a deep uh, variety. Um, but that involves placing a needle much deeper into the neck, touching the transverse process of C3, um, being right in the vicinity of the vertebral artery. And it's really been shown that it has about the same analgesia as the superficial cervical plexus block, which is, um, you know, really a subcutaneous superficial block at a depth of about half a centimeter. And so it gives you uh, great coverage with a lot less risk. And so this is really what most people are talking about when they talk about uh, cervical plexus. Um, what this is fantastic for, uh, what I would recommend you use this for, especially uh, during residency, um, is for awake central line placement, particularly with large lines. So your trialysis, hemodialysis, um, MAC lines, which, you know, sometimes you'll have an ICU patient who, who needs um, dialysis access and it's done awake, or maybe you're doing um, a cardiac case and for whatever reason you guys have decided to do a pre-induction MAC. Um, you know, this is a great way to provide a pretty dense coverage of kind of the anterior lateral neck where you're going to be working. Um, and that can also be kind of supplemented with just a little bit of, uh, you know, like a skin wheel like you normally do. Um, 
But if you get good at this block, it's relatively quick, relatively easy, and you can do it with just a regular, um, you know, uh, uh, regular needle, like a 24 gauge needle um, on a lidocaine syringe. The, the same that would come in the kit, for example, with, with your Mac or, or uh, large line. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's a more nuanced way to do these blocks. Um, like if you look on Nysora, for example, but I think the easiest way to remember this um, is, you know, to, to essentially set it up like you're doing an interscaling because by the time you're done with residency, you'll be really good at doing interscaling blocks. And so you'll be good at identifying um, the sternocleidomastoid, the anterior uh, and middle scalene muscle, you know, the snowman stop, stoplight thing that we talked about before where you see your ner uh, nerve roots coming out for the brachial plexus. Um, and basically to block the cervical plexus, you're just going to inject somewhere around five to maybe a little bit more cc's of, uh, you know, 1% lidocaine in that fascial plane um, in between the anterior scalene, middle scalene, sternocleidomastoid, or kind of right above those nerve roots. Um, the one pitfall I did want to mention is when you're doing this, just be mindful that the EJ is in this territory and that you don't get, um, you know, uh, that you don't accidentally get intravascular there. Um, same as doing an interscaling, you can get a phrenic nerve block too, but typically with this volume and if you're expanding um, that fascial plane, it's not nearly as common as you would see with an actual interscaling block. Um, so when I'm doing these, I will usually put maybe five, five to seven cc's um, of 1% in that fascial plane and then deposit a couple more cc's uh, just as a skin wheel right where I'm going to be actually placing uh, the line. I hope that some of this was helpful. Um, I appreciate your attention and uh, I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thanks.